So here, here's the, 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 not the buzzword, but in endodontics, between resorption and fractured teeth, they are here the, the two things that we honestly endodontists will fight about. And is it a young versus old or, it's, it's not, it's just, it's, the, it, it definitely is a case dependent thing, but diagnosis of a fractured tooth can, can be easy, it can be hard. I saw one this week that it was, they said, I think my tooth is fractured and I did a scan and it was two and a half millimeters separated on the scans. So it was it was, it was was wide open from the top to the bottom. I could see it as soon as I looked at it. But the girl scanned it, as soon as they hear fractured, they know the scan it. And I walked in, I was like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't have to look at the scan on this one. It was amazing, but, but those are ones you go, yeah, probably not a good idea to treat that, right? <clears throat> and there are some that <clears throat> you can't see the fracture. I'm seeing a lot more apical fractures now than I ever have. You know, and there was a prosthodontist out of New York City about a month, two months into COVID that said, wow, we're starting to see some fractured teeth. And I'm like, I thought you're not supposed to practice. Right? <laughs> but, 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 it's, but she was seeing a higher degree of fractured teeth. And since then, there's not a week that goes by that I don't see at least one fractured tooth. I tell people if I see one fractured tooth in a day, I'll see five. And sometimes that's the case. I'll see it's a week to go by and every day I'm seeing cracked teeth. Every day I'm seeing cracked teeth. That's the great part about the CBCT is you see them. There's evidence of them, whether it's, whether it's, and that's that limited field of view, because when you look at a full field of view, a large field of view scan, and let's say one voxel is the size of this TV, a limited field of view will be a four centimeter by four centimeter cube. That's what I assigned to mine. And there are 36,000 cubes inside this one cube. So that's, you know, when you look at pixelization and things like that. So I can see a fracture down to 0.125 millimeters, usually, if you line it all up properly. So we can see some pretty impressive fractures uh, in these limited field of views. The larger ones, you can kind of guess. I've got a picture here later on that I've been showing that'll show you something that's a hallmark sign of a fracture and, and really to the limit of where it goes. But here's, here's a great, this one gets shown, this one that stands up on my computer monitor and all of my monitors 24-7, uh, it just it's because of the amount of fractured teeth that I do see. Uh, this is the best way to explain it to a patient. And again, like I said, I can email you this or text or whatever you guys want. Um, diagnosis of a cracked tooth. So when they come in and we're doing our testing, we're looking at the severity of what's going on here. Um, if it's a reversible pulpitis or a fracture, even asymptomatic, um, the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll say, let's get, I'll call the dentist, let's get you back. Let's put a provisional crown, a temporary crown on, on the tooth. If everything's responding to every normal, we can see if the symptoms result. If the symptoms continue, we can always do a root canal. While we're in there, we're looking for the fracture under a microscope. You don't always see them. There are times where the fracture is on the outer component of the root structure. It doesn't pass through into the internal portion. We can't see them, but they can go further and we miss it. And that's a possibility as well. That's where the CBCT helps out as well. So we do a root canal treatment, permanent crown, but if the symptoms continue on that, we can always take the tooth out. Um, um, nobody likes it when you do a root canal and the tooth ends up having to come out because of the, whatever reason it is. It's just, it, even though we're trying our best, we're, we're, we're there are times, a couple times a year, where you go, well, I end up in this the extraction site after trying to do all this stuff on either side. Um, but I, I try to limit that, again, because implants are a great option. They're, you know, it's, we look at root canals versus implants, and everybody's kind of fighting over it, not everybody. But we're, you know, it's, there's differences of opinions on that, where, and I'm on is it Dental Clinical Pearls on Facebook, and I'll just kind of read that every once in a while. And someone will throw up an endo case, no, I don't, I just, I don't, I'm, I'm a people pleaser. And, and, and so I don't want to get into a discussion, uh, a written discussion on Facebook on something that I believe in only to have 33 people come at me and tell me why I'm wrong, which, you know, is possible, but we all have our opinions. We have one always, but um, I'll see a tooth and you go, that's saveable tooth. I'll, I'll just get x-rays, radiographs sometimes, and you can look at it and you can say, oh, that's, you know, I'm not going to say without a shadow, shadow without a right, but I can a lot of times look at cases and I can say, for, and here are the reasons why I see it. It's, it's when you look at them for, you know, it's what a 10,000 hours to become a, to become, you know, a professional, to become uh, an expert in your, in your profession. Um, 
I've looked at enough of these things that a lot of times you can just look at a radio graph and know what's going on. But I, ideally, I want every bit of information. And that's every person in this room, we're dentists, we're obsessive compulsive. And, and everything we do is we try to be perfect, which we know is not possible. However, we try our best to do, to do that. So that's that's where, where I'll just like, just send, send them over. Let, let me just take a few, I don't want to waste anyone's time. But I want to be as thorough as possible before we either condemn a tooth or, or, or save a tooth. But same thing on the on the side is something we're either going to a provisional crown or we're going straight to a root canal. I'm I'm looking at fractures the whole time, trying to see is this something that's going to work or not. Um, but for me, um, and then you go to the American Association of Endodontists annual meeting, and every single year there's a point counterpoint where there'll be an older gentleman like Mo Fiat or someone who's friend. Or there's another guy in Chicago that's kind of a younger guy, been out five years or so, and they will they won't fight, but they'll get back and forth on uh, saving fractured teeth. Not and what's what's kind of what, where's our justification for doing a root canal on a tooth, and how long are we going to get for it? I've done a root canal on a tooth before that I'm just like I don't you know it, there are some there are always dependent variables. So George Kushner, who's an oral surgeon at University of Louisville, when, when I was taking a when I was a second year dental student, you would ask him a question, he would always answer it with, it depends, which is, you know, it's true. We always want an answer, but there, there's always going to be, a, it depends. So when I look at fractures and we're looking at, hey, do we save this tooth or not? I want, I want the whole story. Well, we need to maintain this tooth for two years until whatever comes along. Or, and I've had those cases very rare. You know, okay, I get it. Here's, here's, here's our percentage outcome based upon the research that we do. Of this particular tooth with the extent of what the fracture is you know can we keep it for two years certainty yes no depends so we're always trying to weigh those options um, when i do a root canal our, our success rates are always based on five year studies it's like if it works at five years there's no reason why it's not going to work for a long long time until it carries or fracture or something might happen otherwise we've got great success with the root canal therapy <clears throat> i i yeah you know, I just when they're fractured teeth, it's always variable dependent. And I'll show you a picture and kind of an idea of where my happy place is, where I will restore a tooth with a root canal therapy, where, will, where I will not, and some of the guidelines that I do with that as well. So here's our tooth. We did a scan, and one thing that we see on the scan where the pointer is is that kind of that diagonal bone loss pattern right there and i had to kind of zoom in and scan until i got to the, that exact that, that exact spot we do see a little bit of it's that's a winding of the apical uh, portion of the, mesial, of the mesial root as well so that's there we could say that's infection it's not it was a vital case but the thing that caught my eye with this tooth that had really i couldn't visualize a fracture under a microscope you could see what looked to be a fracture but i couldn't see it very well but that little spot there when we take a look at it and an axial view, one thing that we have kind of lined up on is right look right in this area here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to come up uh, coronally, and you see that that little hemisphere, that little half you know, half circle right there. <coughs> that, that's really a hallmark sign of a vertical root fracture, that isolated vertical defect we hear about. That's a tough spot to probe. Right, getting in there. So if we've got an isolated vertical defect like this, we come in with a probe, and we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to get into that spot. It's a little bit hard to tell, but with these, it's not. So this was one I'm looking at, going, well, yeah, there's a there, there's an ice, there's an isolated vertical defect. Can I see the fracture on this? I can't, but I know it's there. So this is a tooth that needs to come out. There are some people that say, well, why? But, you know, I'm going to back up a little bit. Why the fracture goes down to there? Well, that means that the fracture is down to there. It's below the pulpal floor. My happy place is kind of the pulpal floor. If I can, if I can stop that fracture by the pulpal floor, we're not always going to see it. Because, like I said, sometimes the fracture doesn't go into their internal component too. But because I can't get a margin on that fracture, that's a portal of entry for bacteria. And gut perch is not going to stop it. Compound is not going to stop it. The post is not going to stop it. You might think it will. It won't. Uh, Mahmoud Torbenija did a great study, and we'll talk, we can talk about it later. But he, he said, um, once a bacteria gets to that spot, no matter what's in there, he, 
because if you have got a purchase study, within three days, that bacterial had, had no matter what the filling material is, that bacterial had migrated to the apical portion of the bacteria and gone up to the So, you know, with that, I just I don't want to put all my 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 thought and work and heart, you know, and just heart and soul into working a tooth that has a spot where there's a portal of entry where we can get bacteria in and out there that, that can cause failure. And once you get failure, then the tooth's coming out, right? So I, that's that's where I that's where I like to draw the line when I'm looking at the, the part of fractures where, where, where to stop, right? And it's really, it's, usually it's right there, that pulpal floor, which is a lot of times is where, where it carries it. Listen, if I can get a margin on it, then not me. But if, if we know that a margin can be adapted to that with a crown or full cover restoration, um, then that's okay. But we just need that seal, is what I want to be more comfortable with. I think I just, yeah, I'll just put this one in. These are some pictures I took. Um, as we look at that premolar, there's a there's a fracture going right through the center. You see, like it's almost like a, a bridge. It almost looks like calculus right there in the center, right there. But that tooth is that tooth is split in half. Uh, this, is, this is a video. Let's see if it works. Yep. Um, so I'm transilluminating the tooth. This is a totally different tooth. This is, this is actually an anterior tooth. That's a lower. That's a terrible video. <laughs> I was hoping that'd be a lot better than it was. But you know, when you transilluminate a tooth, you can actually see where the fracture line is or the extent of the fracture because the the light will not transilluminate through the dental tubules. So you can actually see where the fractures are. Right? It's not my dog, but I love that dog. Okay. We have three dogs. We've got a labradoodle, two labradoodles, and a multi poo. And our multi poo is the boss. He's a little bit. He was supposed to be 12 pounds, but we got this little multi poo that just rules the roost, right? On these two big dogs, and they're eight, seven, and six years old. And last year, my 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 daughter had a friend of mine that started a company called uh, the Perfect Day Cafe. Perfect Day Cafe. They adopt cats, so he gets them. They, they get these cats from the Humane Society. And they've got this place. He's got a bar, you know, food. And you pay money to go sit with these cats and play with them. If you want to adopt them, you can adopt them. He's adopted 5,000 cats, I think, which is pretty cool. We've got four of them, <laughs> so which is which is uh, not what I expected. But I, sometimes I, I talk to Chuck. I'm like, buddy, I wish you would have never done that. Um, cats are fine. I don't mind cats, but I didn't need four of them. And uh, and they don't they don't. Someone asked me earlier, like, do they interact with the dogs? The answer is no. They have their own room, right, <clears throat> that they hang out in, and um, and uh, our, we had a brand new one that just ended up at our place. It wasn't supposed to be at our place. I was playing with him when he was a baby, and our littlest dog, Bernie, came walking in just to say hi. And he's just kind of like, hey, what's up, guys? And this little cat, and I pick him up like this, and he he, he looked at Bernie and probably looked at me and was like, why'd you bring him in here? And did one of these right across my face, right? Did this thing right about a millimeter from my eye, but it hit here, and it went right across here. And I was like, wow, that, that, that was weird. And my buddy goes, you're bleeding, right? I took a video of it, and I just got blood. I, mean, I took my nose like this, and it was right down to cartilage. And it, it was just, I was bleeding here, bleeding here, just like a stuffed tail. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, so I texted my wife. I'm like, can we get rid of this cat? <laughs> nope, can't get rid of the cat. It's your fault for letting the dog in. It was. All right, plan of treatment. Um, so if you're looking for kind of a scalability, so when as when you start doing root canals versus when you're doing them for 10, 20 years, <coughs> like this, there's a there's a point where you get comfortable with root canals. And the question is what's that comfort level? AE, I used to put up a AE put out a new app that was case difficulty assessment. I was like, oh, that's really nice. And so I looked at it and I used and for like two lectures I put it up here and then I, I played with it, then I played with it more. I never played with it. I said, Oh, it must be right. And I start playing with it, and every no matter what button you pushed, it said refer to an endodontist. Please <laughs> 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 don't. Oh, oh, I was like, well, let's not. Let, we're not. That That's. I was like, was this for like you know people that aren't dentists or what? But it was. It was a terrible app. It was a ter I think it was a terrible idea. But um, <clears throat> but th th there's a case assessment form that you can go to, and it's they actually have an interactive one online as well. But you go through it. And it breaks it up to minimal difficulty, moderate difficulty, high difficulty. And if you write everything down, you can put it in the chart if you want. 
uh, your patient's chart. It's all it's it's a bit of work, and again, it's kind of like flow charts. After a while, you just you just you just kind of you can look and go, okay, yes, or no, I'm comfortable with this. But there's some nice guidelines as far as you know what's the level of difficulty with this case. Subjective. There's family. So that's our backyard. She's saving the cloud from falling down. It's chicken little. Mm -hmm. um, it's most places I lecture that like Kentucky's green. Like it's really, really green. And we've got the bluegrass and all the stuff and the horses, etc. But um, usually I show this slide and I just thought, ah, this looks just as pretty out here. I mean, the, the, the green here is just as amazing as it is in Kentucky. But I, like if I lecture in Texas. Arizona, they say, what, what is that, right? <laughs> that is green, and it is, it's, it's vibrant. But, um, but yeah, so the, the little the little kid's playhouse is no longer there. We, uh, uh, I, it was falling down. I had one of my neighbors has a, a, a two-year-old grandchild, and they're bringing her over and playing. And I walked in there one day, and I stepped on one of the steps, and I fell through. It's redwood. It's supposed to be redwood. And they're like, oh, turn on your resistance. And they're like, no, not. But I stepped on it, broke through a step, which isn't good. So of course I cut, I tore the whole thing down, put it in a big pile, and uh, took all the metal out of it, put it in a big pile in the, in the center. And uh, my kids, of course, she came home. She's like, "What are you doing? What are you doing? It was a death trap." And I lit it on fire, and it was a great bonfire. It was it was good. so it was um <clears throat> it was a, it was a good bonfire for about an hour. But that's there's been like anesthesia. Um, the way that I do anesthesia, just because I do it this way, doesn't mean that you should do it this way. But this is how I do it with a great deal of success. Um, mandibular teeth. I always start with three percent mepivacaine or carbocaine. Uh, there's no epinephrine. The great part about it is there's no burn. And some of you all may have those uh, oh gosh, the little the wands. Do they still have the yeah, they're still making those, I guess, right? The wands. And, and patients are just like, man, that's that's legit, right? That's pretty good. And and they love the wand. I, I don't. The only the times I've ever used them, the patient just goes, "What's that beeping? Why is it beeping? What's going on?" You're trying to mellow them up, and and uh, and it's kind of a matter of it's you know, we are going to cause a cause a pinch here. But I use three percent of the fifth cane. I get zero epi, and that takes the burn out of the epi. It's a nice, uh, good anesthesia. As soon as I get a lip sign, I take argocaine or septicaine with one to hundred thousand epi. Um, do a buckle injection around. I'm working on it. It's a cream on the back, and I'll do a half carpool of that. And I'll take a half carpool, and I'll give a, I'll give a, the intraoral as well. If you're every over, um, and, and the mandibular block. And the reason I do that, and there's, I don't know how you all are taught out here. Everybody's a little different. The Canadians did a study. Um, was it back in 2000? They said there's an increased risk of paresthesia using septicaine or articaine, uh, one to 10,000 versus one to 100,000. Uh, percent like one in ten thousand cases it will happen to you um, it's been disproven uh and mouth even malamed everybody's teaching that it's okay to use septicane as a mandibular block i don't know if anybody uses it or doesn't our dental school is teaching that it's okay to use it um and it works i haven't had a paresthesia so um you know, either i'm either i'm lucky or or it, just, it is what it is right the paresthesias i get are usually from People coming in with infections, you know, and it's a premolar that, or a molar that the infection goes into the mandibular canal, and it's, it does a pressure of paresthesia on it. <clears throat> but that's my mandibular teeth. We also know that the majority, a lot of the time, um, Al Reader did a study in Ohio State that showed that about 67% of the time we're going to get profound anesthesia on mandibular molars, whether however it is we use it, however it is we do it. We always touch cold to the tooth before we get started. That's always a nice way to figure out if we have profound anesthesia or not. Sometimes we still don't. Hot tooth is hot tooth. So how do you do it? You know, you can do PDLs, uh, intraosseous, the statement in it, I think it's the X tip. Now, uh, I don't use that. I used it for a while. I had, uh, I've heard a couple guys in town that use them quite a bit. Uh, they get like a necrosis of the, the osseum because of the, those, those bones too thick and they're running it in there and those things, uh, the bits dulled out and caused, uh, caused a, a problem. And I just, I try to avoid problems as much as I can. Uh, but, uh, so I end up, usually we end up kind of working very slowly. A uh, uh, little uh, PDL injection works out really well. And of course, Bruticaine, um, you know, that's, 
that's intra mobile. So when they're sitting there going, look, I kind of feel that, you just go, hold on, give me two seconds. And you put it in the canal, uh, and you just give as much as you can when there's, when there's back pressure, and within a couple seconds, it's gone until it comes back. Um, that's not a real big practice builder, so we try not to do that, that too much. But uh, back spray teeth, everything I use pretty much, unless contraindicated, is 4% RPK uh, with 100,000 epi. Um, most every tooth I work on the maxilla, I never give more than one carpule. I have some colleagues in uh, Texas that every single tooth, no matter what they're using, there are four, four carpules of anesthetic going in every tooth they work on. Every tooth? Every tooth. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So what about number nine? Yep. I'm like, that's a little excessive. Oh, I, can, I can work back into number nine with a half a carpule. And probably a quarter carpule. Um, so it's, I give six. No, just kidding. <laughs> Four, that's nothing. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's what's the percentage is usually. It's like one, for anybody, one carp will give a cane, one carp will use a line of cane in the subject. I'll put it in. Is it IA or FDA? Um, I, I, it depends. Yeah. Um, so when um, the things that I, I, the ones that I never, I've given twice in my career are inside the canal. Um, when I'm doing make or when I do this, it's on the side. Um, if I don't get it, then I'll do a grab brace. Um, uh, um, nothing else I really have to use. Um, I, I, when I go in, I'm always, I grab my landmarks. And the hardest part is when you're numbing someone up and you hit the nerve with the needle. Shock. Right? You always know when they do because your eyes either do this or they jump. And, and, and um, one of my friends in town, he says, yeah, I'm good. Like, what do you mean? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, I know exactly where your nerve was, and that's where I was going. Like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not, no. So I, I always say, I'm sorry, usually I'm saying, as soon as I numb them up, first thing I do is, is uh, as soon as I penetrate the tissue, I say, I'm sorry. I just, I'll probably say, I'm sorry, 10 times. It's, it's, yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry I have to do this to you. And, um, and if they get shocked, you go, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, that they felt that, but here's why. And I'll tell them, it's like, if you get too close to electrical out, and you stick your finger in there, there's maybe a wire sticking out, and it shocks you, that's kind of the same thing. You know, your, your needle is, you know, is your finger, and the nerve is the wire, and it, and it shocks. And so, but you're not going to feel it again. So, um, that's yeah. that can be the, the hardest part about it. What else? Um, with uh, when I'm doing a maxillary tooth, I usually I don't necessarily do a greater power time, but I'll I'll go through like if I'm working on number three, I'll kind of approximate where I think the tip of the, of the pelvic root is. I'll go right there, and I'll go until it blanches, and usually it blanches and it kind of blanches up to the gingival collar right there, um, and then I then I stop. Just a lot of times it's for rubber dam, but also. Um, if, especially if that, that palatal canal is, is right out there and, and it's the pink and contours the, the palate way too much, our, our buccal infiltration will not uh, anesthetize that and they'll kill it. So I always do uh, up to the, the canine, I don't, but premolar back, I'll do something like that as well. The, the, lump, the lump buckle I do, yeah, and, I, and the same thing on the top, I'm on the bottom, so that the already came, I'll start off with, with two go along the buckle, I'll start with the base of the so Do you do mental only? So, well, it, uh, each time or just or just for? No, if you're doing inside, you do mental only. Oh, you know, no, no, no. Yeah, it, well, if it's a necrotic tooth, if it's a if it's a necrotic lower interior, I'll just give buccal infiltration. I'll only do a mental. I'll just do a buccal infiltration. So if it's not necrotic, if it's not if it's not necrotic, then I'll do an IA. Reps, rubber dam. So this, this is this is like my. I, I used to ask who uses rubber dam, and I, just, I, I got let down so many times. <laughs> That's right. I, I got I got this was you know 15 years ago. I got let down so many times. Going all right, everybody use rubber dam. They go no, I don't use rubber dam. I'm like oh, please standard of care. Um, that's, 
This is a picture from one of my neighbors where he went and retrieving these ER doc, went and retrieving files. And that's that's a lawsuit. It's not a questionable lawsuit. If a trial if a trial lawyer lawyer hears about that, uh, this is the lowest, one of the lowest. When someone was injured from not using rubber dam in an endodontic procedure, this is the lowest uh, return on, on the patient's behalf. Um, and it keeps going up from there. These, these are, these are you know, yeah. these, these are lawsuits ah. that came out of something going down someone's throat. And then that's, I agree. Uh, that's not good. That. And if you're, you have that money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing. If, you, if you're carrying a $1 million, $3 million policy and the insurance company malpractice insurance, 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 insurance company pays out, they're going to, you think you're covered on that $5.3 million lawsuit, you're covered up to a million dollars. Three million lifetime per occurrence is a million bucks. So you're you're on the hook for the rest yeah, of that. Again, that's that is, you know, we have no practice but we don't want to do anything about rubber damage is key. Again, I worked on one of my field ball players earlier this week and he had just had a root canal done. I was like, Did they use this? Because what's that? <sighs> you know, and it was everything about it was an absolute mess. So uh Microscopes. This is the microscope I use. That's me before I got my hair off. Um, that's uh, that's just a stock picture of a, of a Leica microscope. You can you can actually it's kind of cool. You can put it up to a TV. I don't because anytime uh, a patient's in the room and then they see a picture up up front, they see something like there. Then you get the microscope. You go, you know, <laughs> they're doing this and you, like you know, a little tiny movement just changes everything. A quarter inch gets them out of field. So so I stopped putting it up there because I want to watch. Can you record that for me? I'm like, I had a patient for the first time yesterday, sat there. I was working on his wife, um, sweet, sweet couple. They were from Mexico, and for her, it was a language barrier. I spoke just enough Spanish to be dangerous, but he was great at helping to interpret. And we're sitting there talking about, I'm working, and also I look up, and he's just, he's kicked back like this with his phone, just recording the whole thing. <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, recording. I go, why? He goes, to show her later. I'm like, all right, whatever, that's fine. So it was just kind of, it was the first time it's ever happened. I thought, that's okay, whatever, that's fine. Uh, fundamentals of access cavity preparation. So why do we, when we access the tooth, why do we access tooth? How do we do it? Here are the fundamentals. So we, we want to make sure we, we get everything in the chamber content out, right? So like, there's a lot of this minimally invasive ninja access that we hear about, right? And I think with Gentle Wave, I mean, uh, there's just not enough research on it. It's impressive, and I've done it. I, like I'll measure, I'll always make an access, and I'll measure my access. And a, and a file, a file is about 1.5 millimeters in diameter, and my access would be about 1.7 on some of these teeth. And wow, that's really cool. Then you take a picture, and you realize all these undercuts, and there's there's tissue, or all these things that are in there we need to get out as well. So I don't do that as much anymore unless there's a reason to it. We want to make sure we get everything that's in there out because if anything stays in there that we don't want in there, it's just a source of infection. How do we get in there? First, um, you know, comets 100 years old, 100 plus, right? 100 and a couple months old. Uh, but comets been around well, the oldest, oldest manufacturer in dentistry, I think, right? I don't, I don't know if I'm right on that one, but I, I, would, I would think this 100 years is pretty good. But there's there's thousands of different burrs to choose from. There's just a sample of them up there. Um, you know, use what's best in your hands. I'll tell you what I use to make my access is what I'm going through. And I used to write down all the numbers. And the, the, the thing that this is why I rely on on these gentlemen that are the, the, the comet reps that are the professionals, because they can number they can rattle these things off. They can look at this and tell me exactly what number it is, exactly what it is. I can look at it and go, well, that's a that's a carbine, a diamond, and a and there's a there's a little ceramic coated you know round burrs that are latch type, and, but it's um I'm a Kentucky boy that's very simple. So what what I'm going to say is when it comes to these things, please rely on your reps to to look at these things and go and go some some of the, some of the ones I use consistently that I love, I know the answer to, but if you reach out to them and say, here's the burr that I need for this, these guys are the experts. Um, I'm an expert in canals. They're the expert in why I did the canals. So, but with, as far as with natural teeth, PFSM ceramics 
for metals, they're just different birds. There's all sorts of different things to, to, to use. And there are times where I'll look at a ceramic crown and whether it's milled or whether it's felt spathic or all these different things, I, I know enough about that to be dangerous. So where there are times I look and I go, I know that's a crown. I don't know what kind of crown it is, but I know it's a crown. And so I'll grab one burr, diamond, and I'll work on it. And sometimes you just go, wow, that's not going to work. So I know in my armamentarium that they make a burr, the CR, that'll just melt and do that like butter, which is awesome. And I, I know that they taught me that here are the things to use when I'm going through certain crowns that I know will work very, very well. The newest ones that just came out, there's a, what's the name of the new the Diao? It's, it's it enters first with zirconia pearls to help spread the pearl the diamonds up the way to help with a cooler operational procedure. So it's it's going to come more efficiently and smooth and uh, cooler. That's brand new technology from our factory just released. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to ordering those and to see how I'm sure I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't the good part is I don't question, you know, with, when it comes to the stuff. I just don't whenever there's something it's like, what do you think of this? And it's something that they're looking into. I, I feel like I can give good feedback. The Germans have a hard time making anything for <laughs> That's right. That's right. It, it's you're you're buying the I don't know, whatever kind of car you like. It's you're not buying the Yugo of a Burst or the Hyundai of Burst. Nothing. Hey, listen, I've got a Genesis, right, which is a Hyundai. And and, and um, but they're, you're you're getting the best of the best, which I love about the company. And and they don't do things. They don't cut corners. Which is awesome. Um, we want to be able to, and again, permit entire uh, removal of the, of the, the entire chamber content, content, which means that we're going to go in here, see where there's a little undercut there. That undercut is going to have tissue or something that we need to get out, especially if it's a vital case. Uh, complete direct vision. That's to me, that's the most important part. I want to be able to see everything. Um, and if we can't see everything, then you can't. If you can't see it, you can't. When I was extracting teeth, if I got hung up, he'd always uh, break off the crown. I'm looking for a root tip. I'd say, I got Doc, I'm having trouble. You can see it. And now he goes, if you can't see it, you can't fix it. Now get in there and do a flap. It was, it was always it's simple, right? Um, we want to make sure we can facilitate introduction of our instruments into the, the ridiculous pulp all the way to the bottom. And straight line access. Straight line access is a very important with our, with our access. And because if it's not, we put too much tension on parts of the file that we don't want to put tension on, that can cause separation. The way that I really, uh, the way that I achieve straight line access is with the H269, it's, 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 um, it's called the EndoGuard, whatever the numbers are on it. It's called the EndoGuard, and it's legit my favorite burr in endodontics. There's, there's, not, a, there's not a second close burr. Um, I had, I had a dentist who retired out of the army. He ended on us. He came work, working. He worked for me for about a year until he realized he was better off in a, in a military setting. So he went back to a military base because he, he I just can't, I can't deal with single employee. And he couldn't. He was the sweetest guy in the world. But he just like he, he would walk in and go, "Here's what I need to do," and, and there would be questions. And he, he just couldn't handle the questions. Like, That's fine. But I, I said, you, "You should try the endoguard." He goes, "Chris, I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't need, I don't need that." And uh, one day he got caught on something, he picked that burr up, and he thought, son of a gun. He goes, that's amazing. Where have you been all my life? And I, I, he was just stubborn, and that's okay. But what it does, it's got the, the, the reason. So there are other companies that make some things similar to this. It's safe-ended. So you're not, it's, once you get into the bulk chamber, you put it in there, it's not going any further apically, right? And as you're going around and you're making your, your prep, uh, the, what I love about this one, the, the, the cross-cut flanges on it, so on some of the other designs, which, which we sell as well, um, they, um, is they chatter. They don't have the cross-fit flange. They kind of chirp like a, you know, squirrels here? Mm -hmm. question. I said that in San Diego. They're like, what? I like the things out there. Those are ground squirrels, tree squirrels, right? And they chirp at you. They, they make a funny noise. That's what the non-cross-cut flange is. If, if you have their normal kind of fur, it, it chatters. It makes a funny noise. Uh, these, this takes that away. But as we're doing it, I started using these. I think they came out in 2002 was the first variant. I remember making an access and using it. And I, I, I kept telling my program director, order more, order more. He's like, we don't need those. Just use them the way you've been doing it. I said, this makes it so much easier. He said, ah, whatever. I don't believe you. I said, um, 
give me a give me a tooth, access it, just make it an access, blindfold me, hand it to me with that burr, I'm gonna make you the perfect access. I just had a, I just had them put one little round hole in it that I could feel and get in there. And I was, I was blindfolded and I made a prep and it was perfect. And it was almost like I didn't have to try. It just you just know. It just it, it as it goes down into the canal work of space, it just goes and it stops. You just, you just follow that pattern around. It's, it's, I would not practice without it. I still have residents when I was down there that knew nothing about it. A couple of things I'm like, why, why are you not using these? Didn't know about it. Like, how do you not know about this? This should be in every person's hand. If you're doing a root canal, it should be like the rubber nail. It should be the standard of care. Um, we want to provide a positive support for temporization. So as we're going through here, right, we want to be able to have it go down through there and place it in there. That's an old, I need to, like, every time I see this, I need, I'd like to get a new cross section of the tooth. And so I went from cotton pellets on the access fill. If you're a general dentist, you're just, you're, you're put the core in there right there. So you don't have to worry about it. When I send them back, we used to use cotton pellets. What we found was cotton pellets, if a, if a fiber came wicking out the temporary, it's going to introduce bacteria back in there. So we lose that 30 day window. So we start, I use Teflon, like an implant. So I used to use Teflon for a while until I got a couple of calls. And they're like, stop using that. It's, hard, it's, it's impossible for me to get it out. I want to pack it in there. It's just so hard to get out. So we switched over to a, a sterile sponge. That's what we use ours uh, to do that. Always need four walls. If I see a tooth coming in, it's broken off of the gun line. It's kind of like, all right, I don't think this is such a good idea. Let's, let's, let's maybe not look at restoring this. There are other options that are going to work. We don't have four walls. I mean, we, we just, we're kind of, you know, running up for a battle. So I know a lot of times that back in the day, so we, need, we need just a little time out of this. We could do that, throw a couple posts in there, build it up. And just like a, some some of the front teeth, you know, it's like, don't don't tap any beer bottles on your front teeth. It's, uh, it's don't don't bite down too hard because it'll break off. So, but you, you want to have four walls as well. When we're getting in, we're looking for, um, this trough, and we're going through looking for canals and calcified cases. The endo tracer is it's the same thing. If you're doing root canals and you can come to a calcified case and you have some of the more challenging cases, uh, these are unbelievable. And it's it's a they come in different sizes, and up to they have one that just removes caries, like but it, it allows you to see everything going on instead of a slope like the standard latch type burr. Uh, these are 31 and 34 millimeters long. What happens is they go in and they can just trough around. Some people use ultrasonics. Uh, I don't use ultrasonics. A lot of my friends love them. I can I can do it a lot easier, cleaner, and nicer than this. It leaves a little bit of dust, and then when you when you take it out, rinse it out, it looks as clear as can be versus all chattered up with the ultrasonic tips. Um, I run, you know, it says 1500 RPMs. I'll run mine upwards of 3000 RPMs sometimes, but you really need it with magnification. They're not super aggressive. You're not going to sit there and run it down there, but but you have to see what you're doing to do it. So I recommend recommend visualization is key with it. So you can get in there and do that. There's an ultrasonic P5. Again, I, I use my ultrasonics with Apicos. Um, I, I, I just I used to use them for post removal. I don't anymore. There's just some other things that I've done. But post, usually don't with post removals. But the ultrasonic doesn't get used, but maybe ten times a year by me. Instrumentation and irrigation. Um, so this again, this is my program director, Steve Clark. The guy is a legend. He, he practiced for 22 years. Um, he had to stop practicing. He used nitrous in his office. Not him, but he used nitrous as an adjunct in his office. One of the side effects of nitrous, two things that are pretty awful, are you know spontaneous abortion. Chronic exposure, not acute exposure, but chronic exposure, spontaneous abortion. I don't have to worry about that. But girls do. Um, and the other thing is um, um, peripheral nerve damage. So you get a you get a neuropathy uh, coming from comes from the nitrous, and it, it takes years and years and years to go away to where you lose feeling in your hands and can't do a paint. That's what happened to him. That's why I don't use nitrous. When people ask about nitrous, I always tell them I'm the nitrous. I'm the nitrous. I will walk you through it, right? And we do. We have we've got great success. In, and just treating them well and taking baby steps. We always book extra time for everybody. Um, you know, I have friends, 
if, if it's going to, how many root canals do you do a day? How many root canals do people do a day? And the answer is it depends on my happy place is about six root canals a day. I have two friends that do 20 to 24 root canals a day. No way. That's not fair. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm, and I'm just like, I want to come see how you do that. Because I just, Jesus. You, I was like, you cannot be doing all the work yourself. Because I, I know what I do. If I humped it, if I worked really, really hard, maybe 30 minutes. If I didn't talk, I just walked in there, numbed them up, and got to work, and walked out. It's possible to do one in 30 minutes, but probably not. I book an hour and 15 minutes for everyone of my patients. So, I, I, I kind of, I was like, okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't, it doesn't process, so I'm sure he's getting some help with his. I, I just I don't know the answer. It drives me insane, and, and um, but it's not for me to worry about. I just hope he's doing quality care. That's all. That matters. Yeah. So, but it's not what you put in; it's what you take out. So it doesn't matter half the time what goes in. I've opened up teeth, temporary closed them, lost the patient for a while. They came back, and the, if they had a big lesion, they're healed. Nothing's in there; but it's all healed up. So it's really as long as you do a good job of taking everything out. Doesn't necessarily matter. There was a study, uh, sterile, dropping, sterile sparrow droppings. I don't know if you remember that one. Anyone, anyone read about that one? These sterile sparrow droppings. This is a long time ago. Um, 1980. I'm um, and uh, and they put sparrow droppings in the tooth to see how it worked, and it worked because it was sterile. It was just a something, but obviously it's not what you want in there. They, it was just whatever. They did some weird experiments. So, but. Steve's always been really great about that. He's always got these words of wisdom that are just these really quick blurbs that make you think, make you go, ah, that makes sense. When we're looking at where do we fill to, we know that the apex is not always, like the radiographic apex is not always the apex. And so that's, that's a lesson I learned. I knew it, but it's a lesson I've been challenged on many times because where we want to fill to is the apical constriction. Right there, and when we talk about kind of the location of where it is, and this is where the endopilot really comes into play, to where it's going to when it's programmed properly, when it's used properly, uh, it's fairly simple. Once once it's ready to go, and once you kind of you learn it and it learns you, it's going to put you exactly where it's supposed to be every single time. It's not a question. Right? It just works. Um, but when we're looking at it, you know, they talk about that cemental growth where you can get dental cemental growth where there's there's a, you know, when we look at a tooth that's had a root canal, you think, ah, that doesn't look right. So you go and you fix it. And then it's, it's not right. It ends up, ends up looking something like this. So if we look at the radiograph on the bottom left side, I have a friend of mine. I, I sent him um, a root canal back. This was back in 2002. And he said, he just got out of dental school. He said, hey, um, that's not right. So my apex locator says it was. He goes, I want to see how it needs to be at the radiographic apex. He goes, I'm your guy. Will you fix it? I said, yes, sir. I sure will. He's, you know, he's buddy. Send it back to him like the one on the lower right side. And the comparisons, the correlations are above it. Uh, after I fixed it, brought her back in, redid the palatal root. She came back in the next day. She said, that hurts now. It kept hurting, it kept hurting, it kept hurting. Went back in, made it look like the one on the lower left side. She got better. Because of this, I was, I was outside the reading, I was outside of the apex, reading graphically, it looked perfect. That's what he, that's what his judgment was, was this is how I want it to look. And if it doesn't look like that, it's wrong. Um, but we know that it's different, it, it changes. Here's a case I did, it's a non-restorable tooth. This is a, this is a case I just, I saw on the, on the cone beam. I thought, I would like, this poor person had terrible hygiene, they were in pain, I did a scan, and just because of what I saw in the scan, I was like, tell you what, we can take the tooth out. It's really not restorable to me. But let's let, let me just do a root canal. It's free. Can I just do one? I, I need a I need a teaching experiment here. Are they going to do that? And, and I knew him. I said, yeah, sure. It just worked out. It's a great. So I look for teaching moments. Right? Otherwise, we don't know. I don't want to do anything to hurt anybody, but I want to do something that I can say this is a great thing where when I look at it and I can look at the endopilot. And transfer in the, 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 the response or what's going on there. When I look at this tooth, if I was to look at this radiographically from here, I would say yeah, there's a canal, it splits. Um, honestly, it almost looks like maybe the apex is here. It's hard to tell. 
it's hard to tell. Is this like a class four? Or what, how does this tooth come together? I did the scan. I know exactly what it was. So I did the root canal. And if I was to look at this root canal, um, just like this, I would say I'm overextended. I'm out the apex. How dare you, Chris? Okay. But I, I relied on my endopilot, which I can, I can use the endopilot. And honestly, sometimes I'll do it where I won't tell the assistants what my reading is, what my length is. I know what it is, and, I, and I, I'll, I'll know exactly what it is. I'll rely on what the endopilot's telling me, and I'll say, hand me the gutta percha. I'll put the gutta percha in. I'll measure it myself. I'll put it in. Like, yep, that's it. And then I'll take a picture, and they have no idea what the lengths are. I do. But we take a picture. It's perfect. It looks perfect. it looks great, but I, I'm just like ah something looks wrong. I went back in for a post-op scan, and that one that was overextended is the one that we're seeing right there in the picture. Um, you can see there was this little this little tip. It, it was such a thin part of root that it didn't show up. It was so thin the radiation passed right through it. It didn't give it gave a reading like there was nothing there, but there was. And then the other side, same thing. Here's the other root. Um, <clears throat> Just kind of took some slices out there to match everything up. So it was exactly where we told it to go. It's, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to see that and say, go from one where you think you're too short to where you're too long, but to be able to go back through and look at that and say, ah, I don't know, I don't think that's right. But we want to give a, a tooth a chance to work. So for the root canal, for everything to heal itself, we want to get as much of that canal cleaned out, right? That's really proper. Get everything out so we can put something in. It has to be, if I was short, if I back that out, then I'd have a spot of maybe two millimeters of, of apical tissue or apical canal. That's just going to harbor bacteria right back in there and cause more chance for failure. So that's what, this is a great case where I loved how that turned out. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this, my Minnesota friends, a uh, little thermophil on the, on the left, it maybe it was extended out a little further than it should. That's one thing that's hard about thermophil is sometimes when it's pressed too hard, and, and maybe the portal of exit is a little too large, those, those carriers will slide right out. The bit of virtue kind of slips off of it and, and the carrier just goes firing right out the end. Uh, obviously those should be identified and, and fixed. And then there's another one that's got a virtue sticking out at the end on the right. Um, my, my, this, is my, this is actually my buddy. He had a root canal when he was in residency up in Minnesota. His wife took the tooth out. It looks like a, if there's any fishermen in here, if there's, you've heard of a bloodworm. You've heard of a bloodworm? That's what they, if you if you knock that up, that's what it looks like. He, they sent me that picture. I was like, who's that? He said, oh, it's Scott. Oh boy. That's but but the funny part is it stayed in his head for almost 20 years. Right? Actually more than 20 years. So looking like that, but it finally finally failed. And then on files. And then on files um, change. Right. Since they've come out, I mean the first ones I used were the series 29 by Tulsa. Which were about as stiff as a piece of reed, and have, have used every iteration of everything. That, you know, we get stuff sent all, all the time, different files to use and try. Um, and there's, I couldn't tell you how many different manufacturers in there, but there's a ton. Um, kind of when they when they set themselves to it, they they go, I want to do something, I want to do it well, and they did. They came up with a totally different design on a file. Uh, and that's that's the goal is to do it so it's going to be better, kind of on the tooth, get it cleaned up properly, and to just do do the right thing. Uh, single versus multiple use, you know, that's the question. I have a friend of mine. Uh, he's an implant general guy that does root canals, extractions, implants, whatever he wants, everything. Uh, in the dust. Um, he 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 uses them. He'll use the file and he'll take a burr and mark the handle. I'm like, you're kidding. And he he goes, I'll try to get. I don't know how he does it. He'll get up to sometimes he's up to 12 times. I'm like, you ever get separation? Yeah, yeah. Does that bother you? I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like it, it, that's when I want to set when the file separates. I'd rather like I had a case yesterday that I went through just a one file system. I'd, I'd use it and it just kind of it just didn't feel right. It didn't look fine. It just didn't feel right. Something was just the difficulty of the case. And I had on the same file, I had six of them sitting there just on one one of the files until it went to the next one. It just felt weird every time I went down there. I just took it out there. If I've learned to touch, uh, trust my gut. We all have a sixth sense, right? And in the dogs or dentistry, but something doesn't feel right, and and it, it may be fine. But if, if I use when I'm doing root canals, if some if I'm using my 
my hand base and something feels, I just something, like if I go, something doesn't feel right. I don't know what it is. Something doesn't feel right. The first thing I do is anything that's disposable, I get rid of it. And I start over. And the good part is, is, oh, these are good, right? I don't, I, I haven't had a separated file in forever. Um, shows the strength of the, the greatness of the, the files that we're using. But also, uh, part of me is thinking maybe it's part of my, my instinct as well. Because can I separate one of these files? Probably. Would it be hard? Yeah. But I can do it. We all can, right? We can all separate. They're, they're, they're single use. Um, just, it's not worth it. You know, there's a bunch of reasons why, and we'll talk about a few of them, but it has nothing to do with anything, but if you're using them again, the things that we look at are instrument wear, you know, the, the cyclic fatigue as we're using them, they're under an immense amount of stress. And as, as well as they're made or as good as they are, uh, when we sterilize them, they get corrosion, they get, if we lose the cutting efficiency, all the things that we lose on a file when it's utilized, we're not going to buy a drill bit if we're using drilling something in, in, in a piece of wood or concrete. We're not going to use it. And I'll try to use it again, right? But it's not too bad. But uh, as soon as it seems like it's dull, I'm just throw it away. It's the same thing with these files because they, they wear down. Uh, the things that we're looking at here's here's a mechanic. This is this is something on mechanical wear. So we're looking at uh, a new one on the left and then one that's been used on the right. And you can see that that edge is not there. And so if we lose our cutting efficiency, it's even more, more uh, uh, pressure on, on the file. It's, it's, it's going to fail. And I just, I don't want to take that chance. I don't like to take that chance. I think we'd be silly not to. If we're in a profession where we make a very nice living, that I'm not going to fret over a burr a, 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 a file or a piece of equipment that costs me next to nothing. All right. Um, let's see where we are. Close to lunch, aren't we?